Well, good evening to each one of you. If you would, open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is where we're going to be picking up here. Tonight is question and answer night, so we're going to answer four questions this evening. Uh, first off, thankful for those that have submitted questions, thankful for uh, your support of doing this and support of this topic, but um, hopefully this is useful to you. Hopefully it's been something that has been helpful for you. Uh, if you got more questions, please feel free to ask. If you have a question or anything uh, about anything that we discussed tonight or anything else, feel free to, uh, to sit down with me and uh, to study that out. So uh, let's go ahead and pick up in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we'll pick up there. As you're turning there, I definitely want to extend a, uh, a thank you and also a, uh, a welcome to all those who are visiting with us. Definitely glad to have you with us and appreciate you and uh, any time you can come back. Well, the first question this evening is, what does it mean to partake of the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner? It's taken here from a, kind of a converse of verse 27. It says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of of the Lord. So in this particular question, we're trying to kind of get the converse of that. What is he trying to drive at? What is an acceptable manner? What is a worthy manner in order to partake of that? Well, the context is going to determine um, some of that idea and how it is to be taken of in a proper way. So let's look back here in verse 24 and kind of flow through the context and look at some of the things he's telling them in a positive light that they need to do in order for that to happen. He says here in verse 24, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. One of the things that you're supposed to be doing is obviously you got a whole lot of things that can be on your mind, but you got to remember the Lord's death. That's the purpose behind it, to remind yourself of these things. But continue on. Look at what he says also there in verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So in doing this properly, you're going through, you're saying about his death, and you're talking about that till the Lord comes back. Also in verse 28, he says, But a man must examine himself, and in doing so, he is to eat of the bread and to drink of the cup. As you look at those three things, at remembering the Lord's death, about looking forward to his coming back, and also about yourself. It's often said, or it's been said, that there's three directions that you look at whenever you're discussing the Lord's Supper. You look first back. You look back to the cross. You look back at what had happened there. Then you look inward. You look in at yourself, examining yourself, making sure you're partaking of a proper way, and then you're looking forward there to Christ's second coming. So, with that all being said, there's another point here in verse 33. He says, So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. That is one thing as well. It's something to be done collectively in the assembly together. It's something that we're supposed to do together as a collective. So, but I do want us to kind of, maybe to, to understand what it means to partake of in a worthy manner. It would be better to examine it by looking at it from what is not acceptable or what is an unworthy manner here. You know, sometimes you have contrast. You know, white is better when you put it up next to black, right? You kind of have the contrast. So as you look at unworthy manner in the context, that's what he's dealing with, is there's a church here in Corinth that is not doing it the right way, and there's some things that are consistent of that. He says in verse 21, For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry, and another drunk. Well, as you look back at what has been happening, there were factions among them here in verse 19. And apparently some of them were going at different times. They were doing it. They weren't doing it as a collective. They weren't doing it as a body. And apparently they were doing it at separate points. And that doesn't need to be happening. But also in verse 22, he says, What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you. One thing that they were doing is that they were making the Lord's Supper a common meal. It's not a common meal. It's a memorial meal. They're two different things. 
And as he's talking about here, this common meal that they're making it into is an unworthy manner. It's not, it's not doing it in a right way. It's actually detracting from it. And as Paul talks about in this context, these brethren were coming together actually for the worse. They were doing more damage by coming together. kind of reminds us of what we talked about in Malachi chapter 1, that it would have been better for them to shut the doors than to kindle that fire in vain uh, on his altar. Now, uh, it's also in 23 through 26 where we're not remembering the Lord's death. Uh, You're not examining oneself. Uh, But also in verse 29, he says... For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. As you see there, one thing that you have to have is that proper respect and proper appreciation of the body. kind of goes back to what we talked about in our class this morning, of understanding who Jesus is, why he came, what's the purpose, the, the suffering that he went through. All of that is included in this. But then as well, we talked about in verse 33, when you're taking it ahead of other brethren. Now, how serious is this? Because as you go through and you look at the question and you look at the idea, well, it may not seem like that big of a deal, right? Okay, just taking of a, you know, a little bit of unleavened bread, a little bit of a grape juice. I mean, what's the problem here? The thing is, look at some of the words that are laid out here in this. As he laid out earlier, in verse 17, that they're coming together not for the better, but for the worse. You're actually worse off by coming to services if this is the type of thing that happens. They're not eating the Lord's Supper that, it seems, they're taking of their own meal, which they're not even respecting it. He says that they're despising the church of God in verse 22. They're guilty of the body and blood of Jesus. They're later in the context there in verse 27. They're eating and drinking judgment to themselves. There in verse 29. And then look also here in verse 30. He says, for this reason. So he's gone through and made a conclusion. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. Why Why is that the case? It's because they're doing it wrong. He's not going through and saying, okay, there's weak and sick and a number among you sleep. He's not talking about, oh, okay, you've got physical maladies. He's not talking about, oh, okay, I've got physical weakness or I'm physically sick. That's not what he's talking about. He's identifying specifically why they were so weak and sick and sleeping. He's talking dead spiritually. It's because they're not partaking in a worthy manner. So there's a, definitely a, a, a large importance put on that. And ultimately, obviously, it's leading to condemnation. So... Hopefully that makes some sense of that and just kind of breaking down the text to understand what it is in a worthy way and what is not in a uh, not in a worthy way. Now, the next question is this, and this will be actually taking... Let's go over to Isaiah 39. In Isaiah 39 is where I want us to go. In Isaiah 39... The next question is this. Is it possible that Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were brothers? Now, you may not know the Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, but that's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's the three, the same three people. And the reason we're here in Isaiah 39 is because this will help give us some context for what will be covered in the book of Daniel, which we'll go to here in just a minute. So in Isaiah 39, here in verse 8. Uh, Let's go ahead and back up a little bit, and let's pick up here in verse 1. In verse 1, at that time, Merodach Baladon, if you can say it better than me, you can go ahead and try it, son of Baladon, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that he had been sick and had recovered. Hezekiah was pleased and showed them all the treasure of his house. So he goes through and shows all this to the house of Babylon, and then here... Isaiah comes to him and asked him in verse 3, What did these men say, and from where have they come to you? And Hezekiah said, They have come to me from a far country, from Babylon. He answered, He said, What have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered, They have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing among my treasuries that I have not shown them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. 
Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all that your fathers have laid up in store to this day will be carried to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your sons who will issue from you, whom you will beget, will be taken away, and they will become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord which you have spoken is good, for he thought, for there will be peace and truth in my days. As you look, this is one of the the big failures that Hezekiah had. He went through and basically he showed all his cards to Babylon. And, you know, we could go through and maybe why is he, why is he doing that? Perhaps it's out of pride or, or whatever the case may be. But what you have there in verse, in verse 7 is a mention of what was going to happen on Hezekiah. And as you look, he says some of your sons, these are going to be the ones that will be taken away and they will become officials. Now, turn over to Daniel chapter 1. Here in Daniel. In Daniel chapter 1. Now you'll notice where Daniel is at. He is in Babylon and he is taken into captivity just like Hezekiah had mentioned. Or it was mentioned to Hezekiah. And then here in verse 2. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, who had ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered them to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. And then you'll notice there in verse 6 that of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That's that group. So these sons that were brought in, some of them were of the nobles, some of them were of the royal family. But it was among this group... We don't know how long that large that group was that these men were selected. So the most I can say is as you look at the book of Daniel, it kind of branches off. You have where there's a focus where these three men are together. But it doesn't specifically mention that they were brothers. There's just not a real mention. And then Daniel, you know, he kind of goes and he has a separate distinction where he's at. Most I can say in this is it's not revealed. So <laughs> is that it's possible because it's a group of the same type, but there's no specific answer to say one way or another. But it's an interesting thought to think about. All right. Well, the next question is this. Is why do men take the word submit out of context? That's kind of my understanding of the question. And as we think about this idea, let me give you just a few reasons initially why this might happen, and then we'll go through and try to understand actually what it means, I think will be a good way for us to go. Now, misunderstanding the word submit, uh, I mean, that can go back to a whole bunch of different things, whether it's uh, application of the word, where there's some things that we know and we understand these things, but we don't know how to apply them specifically. That may be a reason why you can take the word submit out of its context. You can also end up being taught wrong, that you've always been taught this is how the husband and wife are supposed to operate, and on and on and on, and men uh, misunderstand that word. Um, Or perhaps they're trying to get at a certain idea or a certain concept that either they've known or they're trying to support an idea that they already believe that the scriptures don't necessarily talk about. So, But as you look at the idea or the word itself of submit or subjection. It's actually used in multiple contexts, and it's pretty much, this. from what I understand, it's the same word just universally across those. Let me give you some of the different relationships. It is of the church to Christ. It is of the wife to the husband, as you understand here. Men to government. It's also servants to masters, and then sheep to shepherds. All of those are the same type word, either subjection or submission, however it is. And what it basically goes back to to, is it is a military term where, say we had our 
our officer. Some of y'all have had military experience and that type of thing. And he goes and he says, fall in the rank. Well, what do we do? We listen to him and we fall in the line, right? And it's falling in that order. And it's uh, basically the forming or lining up of troops is kind of the idea behind that. Now, one thing that is uh, important to understand is that submission is in uh, specific areas. As you have, let's, let me give you an example. Uh, I have authority over my home, and I have, obviously, my wife and child. I don't have authority over your home. That's just all there is to it. I mean, you may have a wife, but she's not submissive to me in the sense because I'm not her husband, because you have differing realms of authority. Uh, you have this as well, say, with uh, the workplace, and that you have um, servants that are subject to their masters. Well, I can't go in there to some employee of some company and say, hey, I'm actually your boss, submit to me, because I'm not his master. You have that relationship there in that. And, uh, you know, we understand this as well in congregations, where we talk about local autonomy, how those sheep are submissive to their shepherds. Well, you break outside of that local autonomy, then those shepherds don't have authority over them. So um, those are just some general things to understand about it. Now, let's talk about submission as it relates to the home and really what does it mean for the wife. Well, turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5. One thing that is hard for uh, probably just people in general, (laughs) but uh, especially in American culture, is we don't like that word submit. We don't like that word submission because that means somebody else is telling us what to do. (laughs) And uh, trust me, I'm of the same way. Uh, it's, It's uncomfortable because in America we have this attitude of nobody can tell me what to do, right? And that's just the uh, overarching culture. But in the idea of how the Lord wants it, there is a a leader, and a follower. There is a direction in that type of thing. So in Ephesians 5 and verse 22, he says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. And then he goes on and compares that. Um, he's actually talking about the church in Christ there in verse 24, but you have this back and forth that's going on. So as you look, she is under his authority, just like Christ is under the church where Christ does make the laws and the church responds to those things. Now, as you go through, she is to be concerned about his interests and his desires. She is not to control, dominate, or overrule her husband. Now, is that comfortable? <laughs> no, it's not really comfortable, and I'll just say this. You know, I've got a great, I've got a great remedy for submission. If you're a woman and you don't like submitting to a husband, okay, I've got a great remedy for you. Don't get married. That's the remedy right there. If you get married, you come into a voluntary agreement that you entered in, and these are the guidelines of the relationship. It's just all there is to it. Now, as you look at this idea, it doesn't mean she's not involved in the decisions, but the husband does have the final call. But while we go through and we say, oh, okay, that's so terrible of the position for the woman, let me also be clear. You remember back in the garden, you have Eve. She goes and she's deceived, right? She partakes of the fruit, okay? You remember who God was upset with? You remember who God came to and talked to first? Adam. Because Adam was responsible for the actions of his subordinate, you might say. He was responsible for what his wife did. So as you look, yeah, it seems, oh, okay, well, I like being the boss. Problem is, being the boss sometimes doesn't really really jive. Now, As you think about that relationship, we have to also understand um, the idea of lording it over. As you look in 1 Peter chapter 5, it's something that shepherds don't need to do over sheep. It's the same thing in marriage. You don't need to be lording it over. There needs to be a love for that. But the husband or the wife is to obey the husband. And uh, for her in her obedience to over in her obedience to her husband, as he lays out in verse 22, it is as to the Lord. When you're going through and you are obedient to your husband, it's just like you're listening and saying, okay, Lord, I know you want this as a reflection of my respect and appreciation for Christ himself. Now, with that being said, here in verse 24 as well, 
as he says, But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. So it is a general overarching thing, but um, obviously you don't want to have the lording. And as you look in Ephesians chapter 5, we're not talking about the husband, but in verse 25 he says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. If you have that type of sacrificial love, that type of servant attitude in your home as a leader, as the husband there, it's going to be easy. Because, you know, as you think about why do we submit to the Lord, it's out of appreciation, right? We understand he has our, our best interests, and we know he loves and cares for us. Now, probably the question that people have is, what about the husbands that are overbearing? The ones that are rude, the ones that are harsh, and the ones that are just like every other guy that you've met on this earth, right? We all fall into that at some point. But um, let's turn over to 1 Peter chapter 3. In 1 Peter chapter 3. There's actually some good insight into this relationship here. He has talked in the context about submission. And if you look back in verse 18... Well, actually, let's back up even more in verse 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to the king as one in authority. And then he goes on talking about governors. It's one place that we submit. Then he goes down in verse 18. Servants, be submissive with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. Then look at what he says here in verse 1. In the same way. In the same what way? In what same way? In the same way that you have the relationship with the servants, and in the same way you have the relationship with those in governing authorities, we're to be submissive as well. And as he lays out, to your own husbands. Now, he's going to describe a situation where perhaps it's less than ideal. Because look at what he says here in verse 1. Be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word... They may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. So you've got someone here that's not interested in doing what's right, whether they're a non-believer or not. In 1 Corinthians 7, he talks about people that they are married to a non-Christian and about their relationship and how they're supposed to operate. Here you've got someone that is disobedient to the word, whether they know it or not. But their actions, their submission does say something about it, their respect that they give to their husband. But look at what he says in verse 2. As they observe your chaste and respectful behavior, your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, adorned themselves being submissive to their own husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children, if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. So when he had a situation in First Peter chapter 3, when you got someone that's not a Christian, not acting as they should, he doesn't say, well, okay, your husband's not following the scriptures, so you're off the hook. You can do whatever you want. It's not what he says. You're supposed to still be submissive. In fact, in the context, there's times where you look at, as we read back there in chapter 2, where he has situations where the, the master, not doing very well. Back in chapter 2 and verse 18, talking about the servants and their masters, you got some that are good and gentle, and you got some that are unreasonable. In fact, he talks about persecution here that Christ bore. So, I mean, there's going to be times where it's not very good. You may not like it. Now... As you look, does that mean the husband's doing what they're supposed to do? No. But the truth is, the wife can only control herself. And she has the responsibility that God has given. Now, these are in cases where perhaps the ideal is not there. But what about a case where they're being pushed to sin? That's not what the idea of submission is referring to. As you have a situation where, let's say I... uh, you know, I love Alina, but I was telling her, hey, I need you to go steal this, steal from this bank. Well, does she have a right to say, uh, Shane, I'm not going to do that? 
Yes, <laughs> because I would be leading her into sin. So, I mean, there's cases where that might happen as well. If you're being pushed into evil or something like that, she cannot submit because her priority is to Christ. You know, if she's being pushed into being a criminal or an immoral person or something like that, then obviously there's a realm where submission stops because you're going under a different authority there being to Christ. But in matters of indifference, he has the priority. So, with that being said, um, the husband does need to treat his wife appropriately and lovingly, and he doesn't have to be a controller of every single thing. So, just some things to keep in mind. And uh, I think one thing that whenever you have the wife having the right attitude and being submissive, and you have the husband being the right, having the right attitude of being a leader and sacrificial leadership and that type of thing, you're not really going to run into that many situations. And, you know, a lot of times whenever we have our disagreements and stuff like that in our marriage, we come in with a, like a lose-win or a win-lose mentality. Either I'm going to be right and she's going to be wrong, or she's going to be wrong and I'm going to be right. And we're going to do it my way or we're going to do it her way. That does not need to be how it needs to be. It needs to be a win-win, where it is she's getting her interest taken care of, I'm getting my interest taken care of, because last time I checked, marriage was supposed to be a beneficial relationship, not a restraining relationship. So just something to consider as you go through and think about that. Now, our last question this evening is in regard to the Sabbath day journey. And the question is, when did the Sabbath day's journey begin to be practiced? Now, let's go back to the book of Exodus. Back in the book of Exodus, here in chapter 16. You'll notice as you read through and look in your New Testament, Jesus had all kinds of problems with the Sabbath. I mean, you could see a lot of discussion about working on the Sabbath, healing on the Sabbath, and all that kind of thing. But one thing that you don't really see is a whole lot of discussion about this idea. You don't really see him saying, okay, I have a problem with the, the regulations you have on the Sabbath day's journey. But um, as you look at this idea, there was some type of basis of this even initially when the law was given. In Exodus 16, here in verse 29, in Exodus 16 and verse 29, he's talking about the Sabbath. In verse 25, Moses said, eat it today, for today is the Sabbath. Is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. And then he goes on here in verse 29. See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore he gives you bread for two days on the sixth day. Remain every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Now, my understanding is that you have the manna that will be outside the camp. So they would have to go outside to that place, get the manna, and then they would come back in. Now, basically the arrangement of the camp is talked about a little bit later, over in Numbers this time. In Numbers chapter 35. In Numbers 35, they talk about how the how it is arranged. And in Numbers 35 here, talking about the cities here, and he says, you shall, not, you shall also measure outside the city on the east side 2,000 cubits, on the south side 2,000 cubits, and on the west side 2,000 cubits, and on the north side 2,000 cubits with the city in the center. This shall become theirs as pasture lands for the cities. And basically, it was a combination, from what I understand, the rabbis took these two verses and combined them together to give you the distance. So if you had a situation where you're not supposed to go out of the camp on the Sabbath day, well, if you take from the center of it and then you go out as far out, it's supposed to be about 2,000 cubits or something like that. So that would be about the distance that they would allow. And... Uh, that's the basic idea of the Sabbath journey. And uh, initially, there was at least some type of observing of that, even back there in the book of Exodus, where they're not supposed to go outside the camp. But you understand as well, a lot of that was around the idea of working. 
and about how it's supposed to be a rest. You're not supposed to be working and uh, that type of understanding. So uh, there's no real, uh, I can't give you a specific date and time, but I do have the references there in the Old, Old Testament about when those types of things were brought up. Now, um, let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 4 as we bring the lesson to a close. In Hebrews chapter 4, we talk about the Sabbath and we talk about the rest. So what I want us to end with is actually talk about the rest that's in front of us, about the rest of heaven. The Sabbath is brought up here talking about the rest for the people of God. And here in verse 1, He says, Therefore let us fear if, while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed we have had good news preached to us, just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as he has said, As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest." although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. And if you continue on here in verse 10, he goes through and talks about the Sabbath, but he says there in verse 9, actually, is where I want us to go. He says, So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his labors, as God did from his. Therefore be diligent to enter that rest, so that no one will fall, through following the same example of disobedience. Did you think about what's promised to us? Yeah, it's nice to have a day off each week, right? We got a true rest there, a true Sabbath rest where all of our works are done. We've taken care of everything, and the Lord is promising that to us. That's the message that we need to keep in mind that as we bring this lesson to a close, that that's where we need to be going. And you see what was the difference here. Back in chapter 4 and verse 1, is they had the good news preached to them. They had the promise of the land of Canaan, and what happened? They weren't willing to receive it. They weren't willing to understand it, and they fell short of it. He's giving them as an example of how we don't need to do that as well. So if we can offer, if we can help you in any way, whether you uh, need to become a Christian this evening or to be restored back in some way, if you have any question about anything that we went through or anything like that, if we can help you at all, come forward as we stand and sing.